Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Bangalore International Center and to today's program, which will be an interesting presentation and discussion on a fairly provocative subject, South versus North. And I don't quite know about this next line, the Great Divide. But Mr. R.S. Neelakantan, who is the author of the book on which this presentation and the discussions are based, I'm sure he'll elaborate upon that. The <clears throat> typical format that we follow in BIC is that Mr. R.S. Neelakantan will make a presentation for about, slight presentation of about 10 to 15 minutes, probably no more than 15 minutes. Then I will invite two people, a discussant, Professor Govind Rao, who is extremely knowledgeable and well-known in the field of public finance and generally in terms of the Indian public macrofinance macroeconomy. And as a moderator, we have Mr. Pranay Kotasthane, who is the Deputy Director of the Takshashila Foundation. So after the presentation that Mr. Neelakantan will make, I will hand it over to Mr. Pranay Kutasthane and the discussions and the moderators will be on the stage. They will have a discussion for perhaps, you know, a certain period of time, maybe up to about 40 minutes. And then we'll throw it open to questions on what I think would be a rather provocative topic from the audience. I would also like to add that the book is available for sale in the table at the back of BIC. So after the event, or in case you have already picked up the book, uh, Mr. Neela Kanton has decided, has announced that he would be available to autograph the books if required. So please do avail of that opportunity. I'll just make one other brief thing that Mr. <coughs> You know, I am not Mr. Ravi Chandar, as you can see. He was unfortunately called away at uh, conflicting, uh, you know, assignment on an important jury duty that he is doing on a film reviews. So he's asked me to step in. The part that I look at over here is I will say that Mr. Neelakantan is a data scientist. So I don't think that he has a lot of flourishes in terms of his presentation but he lets his data do the talking and the data will talk. The only other point that I would make is that I wasn't even aware of the subject till uh, one famous Bangalorean speaking to someone from the North had actually made this comment about how the South had progressed in all these parameters, development parameters, and specifically with its population stabilizing it was unfair how the Electoral College would move in favor of some of the states to the north. And they came up with a rather provocative idea, which I will not repeat, because we don't want to go down that route. So without any further ado, I am going to ask Mr. Aris Neelakantan to come on stage. Please give him a hand. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, so, hello, uh, good evening, and this is a book I wrote. Uh, like you will see, uh, I, and uh, like the uh, introduction remarked, this is going to be a simple sort of a slide deck with some data and no prose in it, because of, if you want the prose, please buy the book outside, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and, and a quick remark on why this book came about, right? Like. Uh, let's say sometime in 2011, uh, there was an assembly election uh, in, in, in Tamil Nadu, which is, uh, you know, I used to live in Madras at that time. And I calculated the probability of what my vote uh, had an impact on my election in my constituency, right? Like in, in terms of electing my MLA, it naturally was an absurdly low number, right? So natural curiosity took me to what is the impact of that uh, for electing an MP in South Madras? Uh, it was an even lower number. But even more uh, uh, 
so so the natural curiosity then leads you to pick a random state and a uh, random constituency in some other state right so i picked this constituency called guna which is in madhya pradesh so and then i found out that you know even though these numbers were quite small the difference between uh, south madras that is a voter in south madras visa we a voter in uh, guna was like close to about 50% that is the south madras voter was about 50% more powerful so to speak compared to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the median voter in guna I, i i i didn't quite understand why this was and so i started uh, you know this was in 2011 so you know i i started researching the data and you know 10 years later we have this book right so and the reasons for this that is the population divergence sort of running counter to the ways in which economic prosperity has worked is one of india's fundamental contradictions right and how do we deal with that is sort of the most important question of our times at least in my mind and this book is an attempt to sort of engage with that right so having said that uh, the way in which the book is structured is in three parts right uh, so the first part is what you know you can loosely define as state of the states right like so what is it, how have the various states done thus far right like since 1947 uh <clears throat> if you if you look at that and i look at that data in quite some detail which is that you know the what is generally peninsular india uh, you know it, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of difficult to place maharashtra in Well, I, you know, I don't even think Marathis know whether Maharashtra is South India or North India. They probably call themselves Marathis. But the, you know, if if you also take Maharashtra to be part of this, we probably call this Peninsular India. So you know, Peninsular India has really like it, like I argue in the book, there are several indices where the differences are stark between Peninsular India vis-a-vis -vis states in the Indo-Gangetic plains. Uh, that difference is as stark as that between OECD countries and Sub-Saharan Africa. right uh and if you have a single union government as we do and a union government that is increasingly uh, sort of getting powerful and with centralizing tendencies right uh what do you do like you know it, it, it's a serious problem right like uh, on the on the one end you sort of have a um, a set of states which are increasingly prosperous but with decreasing political power and on the other side you have states which have not progressed are generally poor and underdeveloped but have a lot of political power and what is a ticking time bomb in this situation is the upcoming delimitation which is set to you know sort of exponentially magnify that difference in political power all over again in 2026 so given this if 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 you if if nobody does anything to it and if we let the delimitation happen and the current ways in which our uh, you know uh, resource allocation is done from the union government to the states it's 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 not a uh, <laughs> like how do i say this so when i say there's a lot of people get very agitated but it is not a stretch to say that southern states will end up being vassal states right like you, there there is no other way to describe it which is that you will end up with a situation where you have very limited power in terms of how do you determine what you do with your taxes because the political might that decides that rests elsewhere and if that is the situation the basic compact of democracy is broken right if it like you know why why do we have a democratic system of government it is that you know we have a right to say a, a, a right in terms of saying what we have to do with what is our collective revenue right like that's the purpose of democracy if we do not allow that to happen which is what 2026 will uh, end up being then we have a situation where we allow the demographic might to raid the prosperity so to speak but the flip side of the coin is also very important right which is that it is not as if we want children in uttar pradesh bihar madhya pradesh to sort of not go to a school not have you know basic services we want those children to sort of live prosperous good lives with proper government services so that you know like so which is why it becomes an intractable problem right like how do you uh, uh, get out of the situation without sort of a balkanizing approach right so that's what the last third of the book goes into right so anyway this is the structure of the book now let me just quickly give you some basic uh, sort of data uh, in terms of the first two thirds of the or rather first half of the book which sort of talks about state of the states and resource allocation the solution as to how we get out of it i've sort of left that and hopefully we will discuss it later because it doesn't lend itself when we consider a state the most important parameters in which we have to measure states is 
you know, three things. Health, education, and economic opportunities for citizens, right? Every other aspect is either a, a cause or a, a, usually not even a cause. It's, it's, it's generally a result of one of these things, right? Like if you want a well-functioning state, you want, its, uh, you want its population to be healthy, well-educated, and, you know, reasonably prosperous so that they don't descend into chaos, right? You can even argue that a reasonably prosper, uh, economically prosperous state actually requires health and education. The, the economic sort of takes care of itself, assuming there is a reasonable government there, right? So, which is why health and education sort of become very, very important. And which is why uh, I've sort of looked at health and education in some detail in the book. I, I'm just giving you a very, very mild flavor of it. Uh, you know, I, I think I made about 161 charts and my editor pulled out about half of them. So the rest of them are in the book. So uh, anyway, so these are, uh, I guess I've sort of put 10 charts here, just to give you a flavor. So I'm gonna go through these and this I think, are, these I think are important, right? So the first thing, right, like IMR, which is infant mortality rate. And the reason this is important is that, you know, uh, in, in, in Western societies, sort of they have other, other metrics to measure the health of a society. In developing countries, we typically take IMR to be the most robust measure of the health of a society, simply because it's easy to measure, difficult to fudge, and, you know, these are the basic two reasons, right? Because every other measure, you know, or you can take actual life expectancy, which is also sort of difficult to fudge, but, you know, COVID taught us otherwise, but even otherwise, right? Like, like it's generally difficult to fudge when people die and you count the number of people who die. Uh, but if you take overall life expectancy, then you have to wait about, like, the entire life expectancy of a... Of, of the population, which, you know, takes about 70 or 80 years now, which becomes difficult, which is why we take infant mortality rate, right? Like it's a, uh, like, how do I say this? Children, uh, tragic as it is, die in large numbers in this country. In, in, in South Asia, uh, you know, all our neighbors, except for Pakistan, do better than India, despite them, most of them being poorer than India, which is like a shameful thing for us, right? Like we let a lot of children die in this country. And so how have states done in terms of, uh, you know, not letting their children die is probably the most important thing, right? So if you consider that, you see the last two states, uh, especially consider Kerala, right? It's in 2018, and I'm, I have to warn you, uh, all the data that I present in the book, uh, because I started writing this book in early 2020, are from, uh, you know, uh, from that time, 2018-19 data, right? Uh, and then I realized this is actually, uh, you know, as I was getting towards the end of the uh, publishing my book, I, I, I sort of realized that, you know, the next set of data had come. And then I realized leaving it with the 2018-19 data is actually a good thing because I would, it wouldn't be corrupted by the pandemic, right? So uh, anyway, going back, if you look at Kerala, uh, it's IMR7. Uh, that was in 2018. Last year's data, it's gone down to five, right? So, and if you look at the, and that's the best state, right? And if you look at uh, Madhya Pradesh, which uh, was the worst state, it is 48. This difference is, that is what Kerala is, that's the IMR of United States of America. What Madhya Pradesh is, that is Afghanistan. And, 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 and what we have in this country is that with the increasing centralization, now the central government starts to run programs on these very specific, pro you know, things such as uh, there's an impossible to pronounce uh, uh, program for IMR and MMR. It's called Matru something. Uh, you know, I am Tamil and I can't pronounce that. But the point is that the union government is actually trying to run both these, uh, uh, you know, uh, both these states with the same program. And in, in no reasonable person is going to basically tell you that with a single health policy, they'll be able to run the health systems of the United States and Afghanistan. Right? Yet, that is precisely what we're trying to do here. Right? And, and, and the reason why uh, I've sort of taken uh, <clears throat> this is that you need to look at the last two states, right? So, uh, we're in. So, uh, if you look at, you know, Tamil Nadu, which it, it used to have an IMR of uh, 91 in 1981. It was worse than this state that, you know, we're currently in, Karnataka, which was actually, you know, by 1981 standards, this state was doing quite well, which is uh, 69. And Maharashtra was also doing better than Tamil Nadu at 79. But 
you know you know the 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 reason why tamil nadu sort of comes up as a relative topper in most of these things is that in the last 30 years or 40 years it's done really really well and which is why in terms of its ability in, in terms of its improvement if you see how how has it improved its imr it actually does even better than kerala right and this is true it's somewhat true in health it's even more true in education when you see that data you will sort of understand that right and 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 this is how we need to measure states right what is the base effect i mean uh, you know if you have a really high imr it actually becomes relatively easy for you to improve if you have a low imr like kerala or tamil nadu now to improve that and improve that at that rate becomes really difficult and which is where government services or what the government does in terms of its strategy to improve that is 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 really really important right and which is where if you go to the chart on your right that is one of those classic things that tamil nadu did and and kerala you know also already had which is that you would in every village you'd see these uh, white sari clad nurses going in and and you know any woman of reproductive age even if she uh, you know marry someone in that village and comes into that village or goes away they 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 sort of keep track of them the number the, um, the mothers who had antenatal care four times so that is extremely correlated with the actual imr which is how government is supposed to work right you you extend a service targeted at what you want to improve and you see the correlation in the numbers right and that is what governance is supposed to be and and that is precisely what the southern states have done right like uh, <clears throat> you know uh, i'm sorry to point out that this particular state is probably lagging behind its southern peers but it still does much better than all its northern peers right uh, can we go to the next one right and 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 the other thing right like uh, when we consider uh, health the other most important thing is how many hospital uh, how many uh, uh, hospital beds are available on a per capita level if you measure it on a million again you see that you know karnataka kerala and tamil nadu have over a thousand beds uh, you know for a million population right if you if you go to the indo gangetic plains you're in some, some deep trouble right which is why when the pandemic hit i was really worried what is going to happen when all these people actually and and this is public beds right like people in this auditorium probably do not care about this whereas this is what actually matters to the health of the common citizen right uh, and 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 therein lies a subtle difference which is that if you see states which are relatively uh, uh rich but still have a low sort of uh, public uh, sort of uh, beds here that's because you know they probably you know people are rich enough to afford private care and and therefore their their outcomes are okay which is what gujarat probably you know falls into right whereas if you go to indo gangetic plains it becomes a serious problem right and 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 there again you contrast that with what we had earlier which is that you know there are these public services which you know anganwadi is a classic case right like how do you how do you measure if an anganwadi is even working well right one way is to see if it has a pakka building second way is to see if it has a functional kitchen third way is to see if it has equipment which are actually working one of those equipments happens to be whether the weighing machines which with which they weigh uh, ba- uh, children for uh, you know measuring whether they're stunted they're malnourished so on and so forth are, are they working right if you see that again you can see that the southern states do quite well all of them in fact right and and that again correlates to multiple things which is that you know uh, retaining kids in school reducing imr improving the health of women so on and so forth right or right, can we go to the next one please right and 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 staying in health i just want to make sure that we also sort of look into these things right which is uh if you look at uh you know the the first chart is kind of sort of intuitive which is that the richer you are your imr will reduce right like it's we we, we would think that right like richer people can afford better care but even there you see that you know there are a couple of disturbing states haryana despite being quite a wealthy state does extremely poorly right like the positive residual that is the distance the perpendicular distance from the regression line to the state sort of measures um how badly a state is doing if if it's above the line and how well a state is doing if it is below the line right so madhya pradesh is a relatively poor state which does even worse for despite its poverty haryana a relatively wealthy state does poorly despite it being wealthy right and and whereas if you see the states below kerala and tamil nadu are obviously below the line as we had already seen in the data above but bihar despite being poor kind of sort of does okay right uh, so does west bengal and punjab and 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 you know maharashtra is sort of close to the line right and and, and contrast that with beds per million again you would expect that you know uh, 
the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the regression obviously suggests that there's a strong relationship between the number of beds versus, uh, you know, IMR. You could, I don't know if it's the cause or the effect or some combination thereof, but essentially that's what it, it, it says, right? Again, the, we want all states to sort of be in the bottom, right? And, and how do we push that down is, is a question of policy and that's what we want states to have, right? Can, can, can we go on next? Right. Uh, and, and, and the result of, and, and the reason why the previous two sort of sets of data are important is because if you look at the southern states, the problem that they have, and this is where, uh, you know, the, the book, the thrust of the book comes in, which is that the southern states have a uh, aging population, which means that the, the, the ratio of population over 60 years of age are significantly higher there, which means that they actually need all of these, uh, you know, they need a large number of beds per capita, uh, 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 hospital beds in terms of per capita, their geriatric care is obviously far more expensive than uh, care for uh, you know young children so on and so forth right and, and and have that in mind and contrast that with the total fertility rate uh, and you know we'll, we'll go to population later but the reason why i have not given you the actual fertility rate but instead given it to you by you know you, you break it down by below primary primary middle uh, class 10 class 12 graduate and above right so what you see here is sort of a secular decline it doesn't matter which state the woman is from if you put her to school, she's obviously going to have fewer children, right? And therefore, we would have avoided all those problems earlier. And, and, and um, you know, uh, 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 like how do I uh, how do I say this politely? The, the climate in this country sort of somehow thinks that there is a religious angle to uh, fertility, right? Uh, except if you see the data, that is not true, right? If if you, if you put kids through school, uh, you know, their fertility is going to go down. Uh, exhibit A is going to be Iran which had a fertility rate of 6.2 in 1982. And now that, you know, uh, over 50% of their uh, uh, college, <coughs> the, the total number of uh, students in, in Iran, in, in, the, in their university system, over 50% of them are women. And they have a below replacement fertility, right? And it's an Islamic theocracy, right? So religion has nothing to do with that. And, and that's what this kind of sort of implies. And taking these two into consideration, what I want to drive home here is the simple fact that the reason why the previous data points become important is that southern states, given their relative achievement and their relative place in the trajectory of development, are in a place where their per capita need in terms of their uh, 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 you know funds uh, uh, for public health is much larger, right? Whereas uh, 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 and uh, uh, whereas in the northern, in the Indo-Gangetic plains, the reverse is true, which is that they have a basic problem of children dying, right? Like nobody in their right mind is going to allow that. But it's actually a cheaper problem to solve. The way in which you solve for children dying is basic primary health centers, antenatal care to, you know, uh, uh, women, which is like, you know, if, uh, the... As, as we grow older, we, we take up a lot more resources in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 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 healthcare, whereas children need very little sort of early interventions and you would improve your uh, 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 IMR automatically, right? And, and, and the problem there is precisely that, which is that instead of allowing, and, 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 a, and a reasonable enlightened union government should sort of allow for that and say that, you know what, states will decide what their actual requirement is and you know, arrive at the policy thereof, right? And that's why we elect state governments, right? Like to make that moral choice. Uh, whereas with the increasing centralization, that ability is lost. And that is the thrust of the book, right? It is not, the South versus North apparently sells more books, but the, the, the point is that uh, the, 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 the point of the book is that how do you manage a federal structure where the divergence is running counter to general divergence in the rest of the world, and yet it happens at a time where the union government is sort of usurping more and more states' rights. And this has nothing to do with the current union government, right? Anybody who seems to occupy uh, positions of power in New Delhi seems to like, to, like that chair and seems to uh, increase power for that chair, right? Like parties don't matter here. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so that was health. Let's quickly come to uh, education, right? And, and the reason why we're measuring education here is it's sort of, you know, if, if an adult is illiterate, there's very little a government can do. Yeah, sure, there is, what is adult literacy programs, but, you know, like really that doesn't 
work, right? Uh, so the primary job of a government is to send kids to school and retain them in school so that it sh hopefully shows up as improvement in literacy. So the way in which you measure that is a simple sort of a, a regression chart between, uh, you know, what is a literacy rate of age group 80 plus and do that against literacy rate of 10 to 14 year olds who should have been in school in the last decade, right? And, and what we want is at least here, the state should be doing a good job of improving its uh, the education of their children compared to you know relatively old people, right? And if you do that, the greater the again the positive residual, the better the state does. And that's where if you if you again to come back to you know uh, if if you look at Tamil Nadu, right? Like the positive residual from that is sort of stands out. It used to be a peer of its Gujarat and Maharashtra, which are sort of economically comparable states, but in the last 30, 40 years, it's sort of uh, broken away from its economic peers and sort of joined Kerala, which is like not its economic peer, it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, Kerala's uh, uh, indicators are at the level of, you know, uh, Western European countries, right? But it seems to have joined that. And, and, and that comes about by a series of, you know, there's a wonderful book by uh, uh, a couple of academics, uh, Dr. Vijay Baskar and Kale Arasan, they call it the Dravidian model. But like, you know, whatever the model, whatever, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? So at the end of the day, there are more kids in school, right? Um, and, and how did that happen? You can you can say there was a midday meal scheme. You, you can say something else. There was a cultural reason. Nobody knows why. And, and, and depending on your political persuasion, you're going to come up with a reason. But the point is that the state seems to have done reasonably well. But the reverse is true for states like Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Assam. And these are states where you actually had a problem in the first place, right? It is okay. You know, if you if you had a relatively um, uh, high uh, sort of how do I say this uh, literacy rate at for the 80 plus group and you didn't make much progress, that's one thing. They didn't even have that in the first place, and yet they seem to you know lo look at how 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 far below they are from the line, and and that speaks of a lack of governance, right? And and that is what is worrying. And again, the union government and and, and with these two again, policy needs to be to figure out. How do you tailor your uh, tailor uh, uh, you know funding and policy for the specific needs of the state in terms of its development trajectory? Except we seem to be moving away from that and doing that in a centralized model, which is again like you know sort of uh, uh, a, a variation of the health problem in education, right? Uh, and 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 you know why did that happen? Is exactly because of this, right? So if you look at uh, the gross enrollment ratio of secondary versus higher secondary, which is like you know from secondary, like how many kids are there in uh, secondary school and how many of them are retained in, at the higher secondary uh, level? And again, if you draw a simple regression chart, what you see there is again like you know you you want all your states to be in the top corner and as far up as possible, right? And again, if you see like uh, and I, I must admit. Uttar Pradesh kind of surprised me. I don't know if there is a problem with the data because it, this doesn't show up elsewhere and it's, uh, you know, if, if these many kids are actually, you know, if, if it has such a high positive residual, something right is going on in that, uh, that state, which then should show up in all the other indicators, which doesn't seem to be the case. So I don't know what is going on and therefore, you know, it, it, it's an outlier. I don't know if there's a problem with the data, but you, you can look at Tamil Nadu, which again has a relatively high positive residual. And this is where I worry about your state, the state that you're in, which is Karnataka, which has a relatively good base at the higher secondary, uh, sorry, secondary level, sort of, I don't know, does not do a good job of retaining its kids in at the higher secondary school. I, I don't know why that is. It, it could have multiple, I, again, like, you know, why that happens and what are the solutions for it? I don't know, but there's a problem there, right? And, 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 and again, so if we want to measure states, states with a positive residual is how you measure how well a state is doing in education, right? And, and, the, and, and given that we have this, we want, let's say, uh, kids in Bihar, in Orissa, in Madhya Pradesh, in Telangana, e even in Uttar Pradesh, despite it having a positive residual, it's sort of to the left of your chart, right? You want the government to come up with incentive programs for getting kids into school in the first place. They need to worry about input parameters, right? Whereas uh, states on the top right, such as Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and to a degree Maharashtra, these have sort of, sort of figured, you know, how to retain kids in school. 
you know tamil nadu did its mid day meal scheme kerala has you know invested in education for like a three generations now uh, maharashtra again has sort of done okay so these states need to worry about their output parameters that is you know are the learning outcomes good enough right uh, uh, you like like how do i say this so if you if you have a child in uttar pradesh uh, well uttar pradesh here is a bad example let's consider bihar if you have a child in bihar who uh, is not doing so well and uh, you know failed a test or the final exam of let's say uh, class 8 right the question is do you allow that child to go on to st- uh, class 9 or do you sort of fail him uh, which is the biggest predictor of dropout right if you if you fail a child especially in rural india uh, especially uh, between uh, uh, secondary and higher secondary that's the biggest predictor of that child dropping out right the question is do you still allow that child to stay in school despite the learning outcome not being as well as you would have wanted vis-a-vis uh, do you still retain that uh, that child right like the argument is that bihar probably wants to retain that child because their actual numbers are so bad you whereas uh, tamil nadu and kerala can now afford a, you know a little drop in their gross enrollment ratio simply because they sort of you know in tamil nadu's case uh, the uh, at the higher secondary level 84% of kids are in school so if there is a couple of drop uh, dr- if there's a drop in a couple of point, percentage points in its gross enrollment ratio it will still do fine right so this is what i mean by having differentiated policy for you know each state yet what we have with the national education policy is that it actually wants standardized testing for all kids across all states you know in in varying grades right which is firstly if you stand, have standardized testing that's a predictor of having more dropout and if you have a single standardized uh, you know test across all these states with the same policy intent you you're going to ruin this entire chart right that again is the problem right so and 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 i want to point you to this particular chart right if you see here again the gross enrollment in uh, higher education which is essentially you know college or or uh, you know alternatives the you see tamil nadu here again it's at 49% right uh, there are there are other states which are you know uh, delhi is is a union territory so ignore that for a minute but <clears throat> yeah delhi is at 46% so uh here's what i want to point out the national education policy has a target for gross enrollment ratio in higher education for 2035 for achieving 50% in 20 this is data for 2018 19 and tamil nadu is at 49 uh for 2021 it was at 52% right so essentially by virtue of having this national policy what you're doing is you're condemning a state which has already achieved what your goal is 15 years thus to sort of wait until everybody else catches up for 15 years right and 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 that is the story of south india right which is we started running a race and 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 you basically had uh, you know pe- uh, one set of people sort of dashed off and did really well and are like you know far ahead in the race and there were like a bunch of people who are running far behind so what do you do here do you do you do you sort of ask people who are really quick to sort of stop until the rest of the class catches up or do you sort of split these races or do you incentivize people in the uh, back end with i don't know steroids I, I, what you do is a very difficult question right and, and except when it happens at this scale and each of these states are sort of bigger than even big european countries right like tamil nadu's population is comparable to germany right like you wouldn't basically say germany wait until france catches up with you right it's, it's ridiculous um and 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 towards that i want to also point out given that i am in another south indian state which is the national education policy you know it initially in its draft had uh, you know mentions of hindi and then as usual people sort of protested and so they removed uh, 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 mentions of hindi and yet they still retain this thing where they say that we should focus on uh, education through uh, uh what's that mother tongue regional language local language something there of right the problem is that if you if you look at the states where hindi is not the you know the the uh, the, the la- first language that is a spoken language kids overwhelmingly choose english right and 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 why would and and sort of if you if you have a situation wherein you deprioritize english and you basically have regional languages as the primary language then what you what that results in is sort of by the back door allowing for hindi to be the link language right essentially if i know tamil and know english i have to learn hindi 
right? Like, like that becomes, whereas if I know English, I do not have that dilemma, right? And, 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 and this points back to our original question, which is that, you know, when we already have a situation where we don't get enough children in school, even if there are enough children in school, their ability to read, learn, uh, arithmetic is not sufficient, their out learning outcomes aren't good enough, would you rather teach them another school of, uh, another class of, uh, you know, mathematics or science or social sciences, or would you make them learn a third language? Right? Like, it's a, it's, a, it's a question to think about, right? Okay, can you go, go to the next one? Right, um, so that was for education, right? Uh, now let's come to uh, sort of economy, which is, uh, and the reason why I have this here is just look at the uh, chart on your right for the first. Um, this again is a indicator of how well or how badly a state does, which is that, you know, the greater the contribution of agriculture into its uh, a, a GSDP, um, you know, it just means that the state hasn't, gotten out of the clutches of uh, subsistence farming, right? With the exception of Punjab. Punjab is a remarkable, uh, well, it depends on how you look at it, but Punjab is an exception, right? Every other state which has sort of very high, in, in the bottom of that chart, which has a very high contribution of agriculture, does not do that because agriculture is doing really well. The reason agriculture is a very high component of its GSDP is because it has no industry to speak of. Right? And the proof of that pudding is if you look at the, you know, I've taken the most important crop, rice, because, you know, if you take wheat, then southern states don't grow it. And so it becomes like difficult to show that. So if rice yield, Punjab is the only state in the country, the uh, average rice yield in the world per, uh, uh, is about uh, 4,100 kg per hectare in the entire world, right? Punjab is the only state in the country which beats it. Tamil Nadu comes close, right? No other state even sort of does the global average, let alone like, I don't know, meeting Denmark or California or something, right? We don't even come to the global average, which basically means that the reason why, for instance, Madhya Pradesh has 21% of its agriculture to GSTP ratio is not because it does, you know, phenomenal agriculture. It's because its denominator is so slow, so low that this ratio shows up as high, right? And that is the problem. And can we go to the next one, please? Right. And, and this is uh, another thing that I wanted to kind of sort of show you. Another way in which you measure, so now that, you know, we've sort of established, uh, you know, the, the thrust of the previous slide was that, you know, as I was talking to a panelist earlier, was to prove that, uh, you know, agriculture is the job of last resort in this country, right? So how do you move away from that? The, you know, not everybody, like people in this room, overwhelmingly probably work in uh, high-end services, right? Whereas if we want uh, mass employment in this country, we, we can't have everybody do like what a Bangalore tech bro does, right? Like we have to have mass uh, manufacturing jobs. And if, if and for that, we need factories, right? If you, and, and, and for factories, if you just look at the total number of factories, right? That tells you a story, which is, you know, the, the maximum number of factories in any given state is 37,787 in Tamil Nadu. And the next is, I think, Gujarat or Madhya Pradesh, uh, sorry, Maharashtra at ar around 26,000, right? Now, take a look at that number, 37,787, just in one state, Tamil Nadu, right? The states of Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, uh, and Jharkhand put together, all these six states in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, which have a population of about 550 million sort of come to exactly that number of 37, 38,000, right? In terms of the total number of factories, which is the tragedy of our times, which is that what do you do in such a situation, right? Like one state, Tamil Nadu, which has a population of about 70 million, sort of has as many factories as some six states in the Indo-Gangetic plain, which have a population, which if it were a country would be the, you know, I, 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 you know, if, if India didn't exist, it would be the second most populous country. Right, right, right after China, it's like twice the population of the United States, right? Um, so again, therein lies the problem. But even more interestingly, if you sort of look at the number of workers, it it, it again tells you a very interesting story, which is that not only are factory, uh, you know, factories serve two jobs. One is the output itself. Second is how many people do they employ, right? Uh, you know, in Gujarat's case, for instance, you sort of have fewer factories, but their output is much higher because they have extremely high-end automated petrochemical plants, which have extreme high output, right? It's, it's a good thing in one way in that, you know, the GSDP is very high, 
but it, it's also true that if you have a very large automated factory uh, it, it doesn't employ as many people as you know a series of smaller factories right so that correlation and how do you achieve that balance is again something that i go to in the book and i'm sort of measure uh, actual wages and see what the effect is right can we go to the next one please right um so the purpose of this at the end of it is to basically say that you know the rest of us are all somewhere close to the regression line right some of us above some of us below but if if you're below that it means that you're paying into the center so what the, what this is is it's the gsdp of the state with the total expenditure of that state's budget right it's a sort of a useful rule of thumb to sort of measure how you know whether the state sort of needs the union or the union needs the state in some sense right so if if you do that the moral of the story seems to be that yeah the rest of us kind of work for uttar pradesh right yeah yeah all right and 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 here in comes the actual problem right which is that i i hinted about it uh, uh, in the beginning which is that if you look at this rajasthan so i i don't know you know it's it's very it's very common amongst a certain class of people to uh, call anybody who brings up population uh, to to label them as malthusian um and 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 it's whatever it's funny in very different ways but uh, you know reverend malthus in his paper um uh, actually predicted a certain growth rate which is doubling of the population every 25 years and this he he wrote that in what 1798 in essentially pre modern times right i don't know if that is the right word but essentially before industrialization so to speak right but you know rajasthan has actually you know grown at a rate faster than what reverend malthus predicted which is and, and you know what the malthusian trap is right and 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 that is the problem of our times so if you look at rajasthan its population growth from the 1971 census to the 2011 census is like 166% kerala which used to be comparable to rajasthan in terms of its population at that point uh, you know kerala was about 20 million then 21 22 and rajasthan was probably about 25 in 1971 right now kerala is at 33 million and rajasthan is actually comparable to tamil nadu in terms of its population it's at 70 million right and 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 that is the problem which is that you know we have resource allocation problems which is that you know what does the union do in terms of allocating either finances or other kinds of resources to these states given that you know they like how do i say this kerala has implemented and tamil nadu is you know if you if you read the uh, the the uh, uh, what is the chief economic advisor put out uh, he puts out a report in uh, i had of every budget anyway a uh, economic survey so in that he sort of you know two years ago they say that uh, you know it, it predicted that tamil nadu was going to be the first state which is uh, going to experience uh negative population growth in the decade of 2031 to 41 right and and kerala by this measure already has the lowest population growth in the previous 40 years right now if you and this is true for you know telangana it's true for karnataka in varying degrees given that we have such a divergent uh sort of population growth and that that is going to result in uh you know allocation of political power come 2026 when the delimitation freezes what do we do is the question right and 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 anyway uh, hold that thought for a minute while i also go to the chart on the right and i'll come back to this which is that in all of this what the union government has done um uh, professor rao is here who is part of the uh, 14th finance commission which essentially increased uh, the uh, the 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 divisible pool which uh, you know from uh 32 to 42 percent, but like what we have essentially here is that th- that increase the union government by just a slate of what it calls taxes and what it calls cesses and surcharges has entirely sort of undone the work of the finance commission, right? So on 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 the one hand, one, so you know w- there's there's a population problem. Then there is you know we we have methods to fight it, such as say increased allocation for states via the finance commission's allocation ratios. but the problem is that the union government is so powerful in terms of arbitrarily redefining what taxes are in that it redefines some of these taxes as cesses and surcharges and essentially it has doubled the ratio of cesses and surcharges in the decade because of which the the from 10% uh, roughly to about 20% now which basically means that the additional allocation to states the center has sort of you know by a, by just just doing funny mathematics on its paper has sort of avoided giving to states right so there's a there's, there's that problem and then even in the 
in in the in the um in the part that it has to devolve to the states we have this population uh, population problem and then on top of that there is going to be this delimitation which in a democracy is the method through which you know southern states can should and will ask for you know greater allocation because of where they are in their development trajectory right so how do you sort of solve this problem that is what i sort of uh proposes solutions in the next last third of the book which is you know doesn't is not amenable to a powerpoint uh, presentation but it's what i call gamified direct democracy and we will so kind of sort of discuss it but essentially the problem is that we have a situation in this country where um power is increasingly centralized the divergence among states is uh, you know is, is unlike what you see in any other country but and 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 divergence in you know there are divergences in other countries as well uh, you know in the united states for instance uh, you know what what is the appalachian south and what are what are the pacific northwest the, these are sort of not places which have uh, you know extremely high economic activity but and 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 the federal government sort of you know get, gives them a lot of money which is over and above what they pay in terms of taxes but the difference is that in those countries states like california texas new york are the population centers right and and they also experience the highest population growth not because there are more kids born there but because people born in the uh, previous set of states sort of migrate internally to these states right india is and this is true in spain when you compare catalonia to the rest of spain it is true in brazil it is true in china so in in all these other countries where the internal divergence does exist the difference is that their population growth is driven in these areas of economic prosperity is driven by internal migration whereas india is the only country where the poor regions experience a much greater population growth whereas the more prosperous regions have kind of sort of control their population which then results in this extreme problem of what do you do with resource allocation right and 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 how do you solve that problem and that i discuss in the last third of my book thank you all right uh, hello everyone i am pranay i am interested in issues of public finance so that's why i guess i'm here so uh, we have uh, nearly just 40 minutes so that's another great divide in front of us how do we divide this time between the audience and uh, the panel so what i'll do is i'll keep this short we'll have around 20 25 minutes of discussion here and then i'm sure there are lots of uh far more interesting questions than what i have so we can take them up very quickly uh so let me begin uh, directly let's jump into the book so i wanted to begin with a quote which uh, dr rao told me about a, a quote by alexis de tocqueville the famous french diplomat in the us so he begins by saying that and he's referring to the us he talks about how the federal system was created with the intention of combining the different advantages which result from the magnitude and the littleness of nations and a glance at the united states of america discovers the advantages which they have derived from its adoption so he talks about there is an advantage both in the magnitude there are some things that can be done at scale and some things which should be done at a more decentralized level so that was the idea but the book that we are going to talk about says that the indian union has not conferred those advantages which generally should result from magnitude and littleness uh and as uh, neil kanton already said the idea was that the south has gone far ahead of the north and yet it doesn't get a fair deal in the indian union and urgent reforms are needed to set the record straight i guess that is the core argument uh so uh, let's dive in um and there are sort of three types of arguments which are made in this one is the fiscal argument one is the political argument and the third one is the cultural argument in terms of language Uh, etc so let's let's discuss uh, uh, each of them uh, before i begin can, i can I, can i just add yeah. i think i think the uh, all these are subsets of a basic problem which is that uh, uh, you know i i, I it probably it comes from my trade i run optimization algorithms all day for a living which but the problem here is that the the you know the three problems that you alluded to are kind of philosophical in nature right like you you can have different answers to it the basic problem here is that uh, there is some bureaucrat who sits in delhi and who is in charge of running the let's say health systems of kerala and uh, and madhya pradesh or the education systems of tamil nadu and bihar and he 
the 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 mathematical impossibility of that bureaucrat's job right is a, is a, is a more pressing actual problem whereas you know these three problems kind of sort of result in that and, and I, uh, yeah I, i agree i mean we talk about the principles of subsidiarity and all that so okay let's begin before i think uh, going into deeper detail i think when the title is south versus north it's important to identify the boundaries so what is south and what is north in this book uh like i was just telling professor rao the uh reason why the title of the book is south versus north is because my publisher thinks that that would sell more books yeah no but what according to you is the definite because if you look at some of the parameters like you talked about peninsular india but then odisha is should also be a part of peninsular india if you talk about divergences between north and south some of the parameters uh punjab gujarat haryana are quite okay and yeah, that so the, how, the, how would you the define? unviability of the current indian union in terms of its optimization ability across the various states of india is like a really unwieldy book title so so you have south versus north okay yeah i guess uh, i i think it's important to define boundaries when otherwise it leads to very broad conclusions which might not always be right okay let's d- deep dive into the fiscal argument so i i wanted to since dr rao is also here with us i wanted to uh, explore that area further so uh, nilkanthan first the question to you you write that gst is a disaster for the manufacturing states and particularly the southern states so why do you say so and then dr rao uh, a response from you also whether what do you think about this point sure so uh, so uh, So GST has a couple of problems, right? One is its intent itself, right? Like first, let's come to the southern states or the manufacturing states, which essentially include Maharashtra and Gujarat. Uh, a little later, what is its stated objective? It is that they want to concentrate manufacturing to create islands of excellence in manufacturing, so you do not end up with suboptimal manufacturing in states which are not. suited to manufacturing right like or, or some co- combi- some argument thereof right now what does this mean in reality which is that you know we already saw the data uttar pradesh bihar madhya pradesh rajasthan so let's take madhya pradesh and let's take maharashtra right now i don't know every day whatever you consume that is manufactured let's say soap right so the the entire reason why the gst exists is to manufacture more soap in 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 maharashtra so that you know we ha- achieve greater efficiency so to speak and people in madhya pradesh buy it but the problem here is that if you do that we already have a problem in madhya pradesh wherein there are too many people languishing in the fields in an unremunerative uh, 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 employment idea called agriculture like what does the government go state government of madhya pradesh sort of tell its citizens that we are signing on to this project which basically you know does not give you a reasonable shot at uh, manufacturing jobs and, and and you know to the argument of it is going to be suboptimal in terms of its efficiencies so what you would rather have you know uh, uh, the hope is that you know with greater education and some kind of a tariff between maharashtra and madhya pradesh th- there are more people who are moved into these manufacturing jobs with some amount of tariff from maharashtra so that there is a virtuous cycle there and therefore there is greater employment generated and this is what countries do and the size of maharashtra and madhya pradesh sort of warrant for that right but coming to southern states the problem the reason why it's a disaster is that take the midday meal scheme you saw the effect of the midday meal scheme in the regression charts in terms of the gross enrollment ratio advantages that tamil nadu has achieved do you know how tamil nadu actually did that it, because at the time that the midday meal scheme was launched it was called fiscally profligate and you know people just thought that you know mg ramachandran the chief minister who introduced that was you know was a movie star who had no idea what he was doing right like the but you know 40 years later we have that to thank for tamil nadu's you know high enrollment ratios high female labor force participation rate high per capita income you know the number of factories so on and so forth right like so it's a it's a virtuous cycle now the state government of the day made a moral decision say, stating that this is an important thing and that is what my voters have elected me for and therefore i'm going to do this regardless of what the costs in terms of fiscal profligacy accusations are and that is what a state government is supposed to do it might fail it could have failed spectacularly right like uh, mg ramachandran's iteration of the midday meal scheme was not the first there were two iterations before right one was by kamraj which failed for the same reasons of its uh, the government's ability to fund it and the first one was in 1924 by the justice party which again fell for the same reason like governments can introduce policies that fail the reason why the gst is a disaster is because it 
eliminates the ability of the state to raise revenues other than, you know, raise new revenues, which is what M.G. Ramchandran did in terms of additional sales taxes to fund the midday meal scheme. Now, no state in the union has that ability. How is that? Like, what are we electing state governments for if that state government does not have this ability to do that, right? Like, we're just electing glorified bureaucracies then. Why would we do that? So, uh, Nilakantan, isn't revenue a function of the rate multiplied by the total money that you collect out of it, right? So, uh, wouldn't, uh, for example, if your economy is growing, you will still collect more tax out of it. Second, uh, the rate itself is defined by the GST council now, right? Isn't It's not that the union government is deciding. So, do you... So, uh, let, let's, okay. uh, let's take Dr. Rao into this and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very interesting presentation. Um, in fact, I'm uh, quite interested in this because I've been dabbling on interregional disparities for a long time. But my apologies to begin with because I have not read your book. So some of the interpretations, some of the inferences that I may draw may not be entirely correct. So with that caveat, I am, you know, sort of, I would uh, like to. Now, um, there are some areas of agreement. Whether one size fits all type of uh, uh, policies are appropriate, Certainly not for this country, such as diverse. If you if you India calls itself a federalism, the major advantage is to, as I said, to gain f from economies of scale in terms of uh, you know defense and then larger common market and various other things. But at the same time, to to meet the diversified preferences of the people. So. Obviously, you have multiple identities. So if you say that one size fits all, and that is the type of policy I will follow, that doesn't work that way. But, but in terms of, uh, if you go to the nitty gritty of things, now you to start with the education, healthcare, you know, the various differences, all that. But that itself is a function of quite a number of things. These disparities, some of them are historically given. You know, in Kerala, for example, you had missionaries, and in some of the earlier, you know, sort of uh, in the colonial era, there were, you know, category A provinces and category B provinces. Some of those rulers in you know, the, 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 you know, where, you know, the Travancore Cochin Maharajas. Very interestingly, let me point out uh, this. There are uh, two or three papers. Abhijit Banerjee and Lakshmi Iyer did in 2005, one in economic, uh, one in American Economic Review, where they mapped the land tenure system with the agricultural productivity. And then in the second paper, they ask actually go into the investment in education, investment in healthcare, investment in roads. Now they find that in areas where there were large, big landlords, the investments were bad, agricultural productivity is bad. I mean, right from then on, agricultural productivity has been bad and so on and so forth. So there are, there are factors like that. Later on, <clears throat> you know, when the things, for, you see, in fact, if you have seen in four or five days ago, Nitin Desai wrote an article in Business Standard on the issue of North, you know, in a sense, he didn't say North versus South, but broadly, North and East, he brought in and then South. Now, the, the point is that, see, the institutions 
history and institutions determine the nature of incentives. Uh, let me, you know, yeah, let me very rudely put one of those stories which Mansur Wilson talks. You know, in the early 20th century in China, you had large number of, number of roving bandits. And when you had so, so many roving bandits, there was no incentive to, to save, incentive to invest, incentive to grow. At that time, <coughs> some Ye Hu Siang, or one of the stronger roving bandits, killed White Wolf, who was another roving bandit, and he became, he said, he told the people, you give a constant share of your income and I look after you. So in the first case, there was no growth, there was no incentive. In the second case, there was growth. So from stationary bandit, you moved into a, uh, from a roaming bandit, you moved into a stationary bandit. But then the growth was not encompassing, then he goes on to talk about it. The basic thing is that there are, in, in quite a large number of these areas, indo gangetic plains, you have, the institutions which do not have the incentive structure. So we need to go behind that. And that you may say governance. I mean, it's more than governance because the governance has been taken over by these roving bandits. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm basically talking in a very generalistic way. But the point is, I mean, even today you hear, read the stories of uh, politicians' sons killing, raping, and doing things like that. And nothing happens. That fellow continues as a union minister. Okay, now, so history and institutions are important. And, you know, sort of, if you see the areas where growth has been done and then the improvement in this thing has been done, it may be, it doesn't, it may, not, may not match exactly, but that's, that's one of the, the important things that comes out of that. Now, now if you look at, um, you know, the, that's, that, that talks about your infant mortality rate. You know, there was a committee in, um, on universalizing health care with Srinath Reddy as the chairman. And I happen to have been a member of that committee. This was in 2012-2013. Now if you, according to the Ministry of Health, there is a norm. According to that, if you really spend money on health care and uh, you know, particularly health care, the sub-centers, health centers, community health centers, etc. You need something like 3% of GSDP, 3% of GDP. And obviously in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, uh, and Madhya Pradesh, uh, to some extent Rajasthan, they don't exist. So obviously, so since they don't exist, this is, you know, obviously children, you know, the mortality rate is quite high. Even if they exist, what happens is that it's not very certain that they will be there. In fact, the schools may be there, but the teachers may not be there. I mean, that's, that's why I said, talked about the incentive structure. I mean, you have Pratham doing all these surveys every year and then seeing the education, you know, so the learning levels. So I think you need to be a little more nuanced in terms of, um, you know, this thing, and, you know, Arvind Panagadiya, Punaki Chakravarti, and I wrote a book on um, uh, growth and development in Indian states it's in 2015. And then there was a time in Bihar between 2002 and, and 2010, it grew at the rate of 9%. And um, there were reforms that were happening in Gujarat, there were reforms that were happening in Andhra Pradesh. So we had three case studies that was done. And then that is also published in the book called Making Miracles in Indian States. I mean, this is, again, Arvind Pangadia and myself, uh, you know, put them together. Lots of these discussions come in there, you know, sort of. Uh, now, Dr. Rao, uh, one question on the GST and that resource allocation. GST and? The 
one the no no i will i will talk about one more thing and then i'll come to gst uh no on this uh, question of you know sort of ensuring you know the basic thing is that you know you need to understand that growth and investment doesn't come from the government you know government's contribution to the investment is you know public investment if you really see somewhere you know it's less than 25% much of it but then that's an important investment because basic infrastructure basic services have to be provided there much of it has to come from the private sector and the private sector broadly depends upon i mean it's not just the volume of investment it is on the the economic climate it's on the you know what sort of a nature of uh, uh, system that exists again the incentives matter now i mean this is as far as the total investment is concerned but even if you talk about the public this thing you know i mean the unfortunate part of it is the the constitution gives only the finance commission for transfer of resources but then there are other this thing but then the finance commission is supposed to actually give the money only for maintaining things not for creating things creating things has to from come from article 292 and so 293 which is basically loans and loans have been tied to you know after the particularly after the rule based fiscal policy percentage of gstp and per capita gstp is low per capita loan is low obviously the total volume of investment available is low that's in, in this in these states but given within the the transfers that we are talking about i mean you did mention that from 32 to 42% it's not really true 13th finance commission gave 32% but then there was a planning commission at the time and the planning commission's contribution was somewhere about 6.2% of the divisible pool which means 38.5% and then you know but then when you and then of course finance commission also gave specific purpose transfers 150 crores for the lake rejuvenation here 150 crores for temple rejuvenation in tamil nadu etc etc the 14th finance commission said no we will not give any do this because we we are only a temporary body so what we did is we added the 32 to 38% and then we found out that the union government spending on the state subjects that's where centralization has been taking place has increased from 12% to 17% between 2005 and 2012 now why should the union government if it doesn't have money spend on state subjects now this is where the issue comes i mean similarly it has increased in the case of kanad subject the issue comes here because if you really look at the theory you got the conceptual thing general purpose transfers which the finance commission gives is supposed to enable the states to provide a given level of services at a given tax effort it's enabling it's a general purpose it is not to ensure that is the reason why things like basic education basic health care which martin felstein calls it categorical categorical equity goods they are there the the transfers are specific purpose transfers are to be given to ensure given standard of service you define what should be the minimum standard of service and then design your transfer to ensure that particular thing in our country what we have done is so actually as far as the finance commission is concerned the the difference is somewhere about 32 from 40 we went about 42% anyway and so that's a general purpose transfer specific purpose transfers when you say you know i mean they had 227 of them this was consolidated into 447 umbrella schemes by the previous government they further consolidated into 66 cons- the umbrella schemes and finally when the finance commission gave this recommendation 
two things that done one thing you mentioned about the cessation surcharges because the divisible pool consists of gross central tax revenue minus the cessation surcharges minus the cost of collection doctor i'm sorry to interrupt i'm mindful of time we just have around 15 minutes left okay so. now i'll 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 take only 3 minutes yeah on the gst uh, yeah so obviously there are so there were lots of problems with uh, this. so two things one is successes and surcharges second one is this so the transfers in real terms have really not increased all that much you know this is one of the even though the the central government went on complaining about it and even in the term of reference to the 15th finance commission said that oh those people are overly generous and then you try to cut down I and mean, that's what the now so obvious there are in other words is it the discussions so i will say that it has to be you know from here to go into the other thing since i, I have not seen your final conclusion i would say north and south and as far as the goods and services tax is concerned you know there have been a lot of problem you see we talk about a lot of cooperative federalism but what you have is actually competition between the states this need to be monitored it's not that uh, your predatory competition should be removed basically competition is healthy so long as it is healthy sales tax has been a problem they brought in the value added tax that again was an origin based tax it was an origin based tax because the the state where the mon money accrued was the one getting it not the states where the sales were taking place so destination based you know consumption type value added tax on goods and services is what has been done now the states have voluntarily gotten into it i mean they have been coerced to do it in some ways or incentivized to do it some ways they were told that you see you will get 14% growth in your revenue until the time you get a, you, it stabilizes and states thought that fine i mean 14% revenue was but too generous it didn't happen you know in the previous years so so that was give that was promised to them they so it was uh, in a sense you see in one of the major problems in the indian federalism is that we do not have an institution for intergovernmental bargaining and conflict resolution we don't have and that that is important whether it is cooperation or it is uh, competition and uh, you know interstate council was recommended by the sarkariya commission the government of india started the interstate commission in the constitution but has placed it under the union home ministry a player cannot be an umpire okay now that's so in that sense gst council is an important innovation where you have both union and the states come together and except uh, the gst I, council I, has no, the union's no, veto so states gave up their revenue autonomy in favor of tax harmonization you know i am not saying that but then that states willingly fell into this you know they thought that they will gain but they still are maybe right because one of the problems that happened is that technology had not stabilized when the gst was imposed and even now the technology is not fully stabilized one you know all over the world where the gst or the value added tax on goods and services is imposed it had turned out to be a money machine it's quite possible you know there is a working paper of the the uh, better school of economics where rangrajan wanted me to write something on gst which has been written 2 months ago there are lots of more lot more of reforms that need to be done you don't have to have four tax rates but then but then one of the great things that has happened is if if that you consider the supreme court decision which basically said gst council is only a recommended body it is the government which is a sovereign body it is the legislature which is a sovereign this thing so obviously if things don't work out they can come out of it i mean in the sense that there is hmm. they you know the beautiful part is they the gst council may recommend a particular rate particular state may say i don't agree with this now whether they will do it or not is a different thing 
I, um, I, I'm, I'm really curious. I, I, I'm waiting for one state to do that. No, I mean, you know, sort of, if they, if they do it, that's fine, but that's left to the states, right? I mean, that's not something. But the Supreme Court has very clearly stated that GST, the council is only a recommended body. So anyway, I mean, in the sense, this is, so that, uh, that issue is one of, I mean, tax harmonization is good for the, the economy and not, you know, it's, um, it, earlier they used to have all sorts of tax competition that was taking place. Goa was not taxing certain things and then there was a lot of trade diversion that was taking place earlier. Certain amount of, amount of decision has come into play. Okay, there are countries, there are only three examples of so, GST, so, subnational so GST. Should I take yeah, another I question? Yeah. There, I'll stop within a minute. There are only three examples of subnational GST. Canada, European Union, and Brazil. It's called the good, the bad, and the ugly. Even in Canada, which is supposed to be good, there are provinces which don't live with GST. There are provinces which had retail sales tax, but withdrew the retail, and then joined the GST, but then they have come back to the retail sales tax. So there are issues. So there are, this is a reform in the making. So let us hope, let us recommend the right type of this thing. Let us hope, let us things will happen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I had other questions, but let's, since we have just 10 minutes, let's take questions from the audience. That's far more interesting. OK. Uh, good evening, Mr. Neil Kanton. My name is Vinay. Uh, I was hoping if you could spend some time on the foreign policy dimension, if any, of this north-south divide. You spoke of economic, uh, cultural, political, but is there a foreign policy dimension? Uh, external factors contributing to this north-south divide, if any, and north-south divide impacting foreign policy, if any. Sri Lanka often comes to mind, Delhi overruling Chennai, etc. But beyond that, do you think there's a foreign, foreign policy dimension? Thank you. I'll try to be quick, but um, an Indian state is too big an administrative unit to govern in general. States both in North and in South, with perhaps Kerala as an exception, have failed to decentralize. So if I follow your logic further down, I could very well claim that the state of Karnataka is notorious. It takes all the hard-earned tax money from Bangalore, uh, a very significant chunk of which made possible by migrants from the North, and redistributes it to the rest of uh, the state. And this, to me, is a bigger travesty because there aren't even historical hang-ups, like freight equalization policy and so on, that you failed to mention in your presentation at least. Um, adding on to that, principle of subsidiarity is great, but the caveat always is that the extent of market should not be curtailed uh, by its constituents. Uh, and I think GST removing those curtailments should be welcome. So what, uh, what's your opinion on both of these? So let me take that first. Um, uh, let me take the first question first, uh, which is that, uh, so uh, uh, the third section of my book goes into what is gamified direct democracy, which offers a solution for this, right? If you, and, and the idea of that is a, a what I call as a, a conservative system designed for hopefully what is a path towards enlightened liberalism, right? Like that, that's, the, that's the philosophical intent of that particular uh, uh, you know, idea. Now, if you, if you were to follow that, and if we were to arrive at a situation wherein what you just sa said, which is that, you know, if there is a significant minority in some, some, some part of the country which feels very, very strongly about something, such as, let's say, uh, you know, the Sri Lankan Tamil issue, or, you know, so, so, you know uh, West Bengal might have a very strong opinion on something uh, related to Bangladesh, or so, so, sort of this system sort of organically allows for that to be resolved, A. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, how that will be, uh, you know, please buy the book, read it. Um, the, to the second question, um, again, the same logic offers uh, that particular thing, which is that it is true, like, you know, just like, uh, you know, India as a unit is not sacrosanct, neither is Karnataka. Why do you assume that, you know, uh, that would be the case? If people, there are sufficient people in Bangalore, and they're, like, once you're in Bangalore, you're a citizen of Bangalore, right? Like, there's no point of, you know, saying that I'm coming from the north. No, you're, you're a citizen of Bangalore, and, and hopefully that is what a democracy is about, that you feel a sense of belonging to the place in which you work and live, right? Uh, and, and, and if you do that, and in this particular idea of gamified democracy, 
should things to come to pass and should you know bangalore honestly think that you know it, it, it is passing on too much to other parts of karnataka or any other part it will do exactly what the gamified direct democracy appro uh, you know uh, approach is which is an orderly trans like the idea of the right to self determination which is that we decide as a, a, a as a as a unit to basically govern ourselves is sacrosanct and how we do that and what is the extent of doing that is decided in a sort of like you know uh, you know the lowest factor is n equal to 1 which is me right like that that would be a very silly idea uh, you know the other end is like you know treat the 8 billion people of the world as a single unit again a silly idea what is the point of optimality at which this can offer reasonable solutions and that point of optimality need not be the same point for different sort of uh, issues of governance and that is what gamified direct democracy hopes to achieve could you give an example of this quickly like on what issue would let's 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 take uh, uh, you know um, i don't know let's take a lightning rod let's say article 370 right now if there are uh, uh, let's say that you know people in uh, certain parts of the country or uh, or let's take caa right like article 370 is sort of problematic because uh, i don't know what is the extent of minority uh, in, in in the vote in kashmir right let's take uh, you know nrc uh, or the legislations that were passed thereof right if a significant minority of this country which uh, i'm guessing you know uh, is greater than 20% the way in which this would work is that uh, how much time do we have can we we have 6 minutes okay so okay <laughs> so here here so uh, let me give you a simple example right so gamified direct democracy so there is the athenian democracy I, i'm guessing all of you would have read that in school which is that you know all uh, land owning free men in ancient athens basically went to a public square and decided to i don't know poison socrates to death because he whatever so so that 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 version of majoritarian tyranny is the athenian democracy right the, the 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 good thing about it is that it has a perfect transmission efficiency in terms of the will of the people being transmitted into governance very often the problem is that it will descend into majoritarian tyranny right the other end of the spectrum is that you know what we have now which is that we elect an mp we elect one mp for what is about the size of a small european country and uh, you know those guys go into parliament and they are they, they, you know your i i don't know is this south bangalore west bangalore central bangalore what, what? your mp i'm pretty sure it doesn't matter whether you are completely in agreement with him or her and, and and they are in agreement with you right it doesn't matter they have to vote as their party tells them to vote in parliament right so like we we and each of their vote in parliament results in a transmission loss in terms of the policy you know a uh, prerogative of the uh, of the electorate right like so this is at the other end so how do you arrive at a system which sort of balances these two that is takes the uh, 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 old athenian democracy in terms of its transmission efficiency takes the modern sort of liberal democracy in terms of its checks and balances and you know parliamentary expertise and law making and uh, you know oversight and what not combines these two and yet adds further guardrails in terms of uh, uh, you know not descending into majoritarian tyranny right like that is gamified direct democracy right now to any of these lightning rod issues if there is a significant enough minority which basically feels strongly enough that they do not want something like that to pass they will have the ability to veto that right now the cost of the uh, 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 the, the the system basically is lenient towards people who either want to bring about a legislation or want to veto a legislation but sort of forces a cost on people who actually have achieved what they intended to do so that it sort of moves in a slow fashion forward right so you know that's the hope of democracy which is that over a long enough period of time we so, we go sufficiently slowly so that we believe that you know uh, the, the 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 idea of uh, Uh, like how do i say this our appeal to the better angels will hold true over a sufficient long arc of history right thanks we have time for one last question uh, we have two of them both of you can both of you can ask the question and then i'll hope to answer so thank you for your talk been enjoyable um so athenian democracy didn't allow women to speak so if any woman wants to speak i'm i can give up my question <laughs> we have not allowed any woman to speak that is a any dude woman? move well done <laughs> Any woman wants to ask a question? Okay, all right. So it's worth asking why certain states have good governance, and I think the reason is 
all the states that have good governance have very strong on-ground rational movements. Dravidian movement, the Periyarite movement, Bengal and Kerala were outliers a little bit, right? That's because of the communists. Maharashtra is an outlier because of the Ambedkarites. Haryana is an outlier in the other direction, but that's because they have Kap Panchayats, right? And UP and so on, Rajasthan has no on-ground rationalist movement. Can I, can I, can I, can I Sorry, just one second. Could you quickly, it's 20 question seconds. please. 20 seconds, that's all. Karnataka has an on-ground movement, but it's not rationalist. So along with your technocratic proposals, I'm wondering if there's a political solution to this, which is start on-ground rationalist movements. Can I answer that first? Sure. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, increasing centralization is one troubling uh, phenomenon, but there's another one that's also very troubling, which is the devaluation of data as a basis for policy making. Uh, we've, we've had important economic surveys conducted and the results are not released with vague excuses, oh, something was wrong. And now it's looking like the census also might not be uh, conducted. But my question is that data is seen as an esoteric subject that only experts deal with. And what we need to buckle this trend is to raise the importance of data in the public consciousness. So how could we go about doing that? Uh, yes. Sorry, I think we are really yeah, out of time. It's a short uh, question. Uh, yeah, but we don't have the time for answers. Uh, see, I, uh, Hindi is a big divide uh, between North and uh, South, the language. So uh, according to you, which other uh, um, parameter is a big divide? So you have one minute to answer all these sure. questions. Can I, can, can I uh, answer the question? Uh, the, uh, sir, uh, to answer your question on data, uh, somebody asked me what is my favorite work of fiction. I have to say uh, the back series data of G GDP, <laughs> which went back to 2011, that was released by the central government in 2019, 18, I think. That was the best work of fiction. I agree. <laughs> uh, to your question, Hindi, I... Like what language you speak is largely, I don't know, to me it's irrelevant, as long as you're not hegemonic about it, right? Uh, and and uh, I forget, yes, uh, so to the answer uh, uh, of starting rationalist movements, uh, again, the idea is that gamified direct democracy results in an environment where you know, a, a million rationalist movements may bloom. I agree with your thesis in that there is a greater degree of subnationalism in all of these states that you mentioned, because of the of which people have a sense of belonging to their society, because of which there's a virtuous cycle, right? Now, it is not your job and my job to tell people to do that. The hope is that if you have a uh, uh, if you have a system which values every citizen and their right to representation, hopefully that will happen on its own. Thank you so much. It's 8 o'clock, so I'll end it on time. Thanks, Neil Gunton. Thanks, Dr. Rao, for this conversation. Uh, yeah, and the book is available. Please do buy it. It's a provocative read. Please do read. I'm glad we could have a civil and healthy conversation about it. Please do read, write about it, and that's how we'll come to better conclusions about this particular problem. So thank you very much. Thank you.